Good evening, everybody. On behalf of the Christadelphians, I'd like to welcome you all here to our public address. My name is Jimmy, and this is James. And tonight, James is going to present the first in a two-night series, the series being Questions Evolution Can't Answer, Answers from the Creator. And so tonight, James is really going to focus on arguably one of the most important verses in the Bible, Genesis 1, verse 1. And then next week, I'm going to have a look more at the physical creation around us and some of the wonders that we find in that. So before we jump into it, we will open with a word of prayer. And we'll do that now. Our oh, great God above, we come and we bow before you now, Father, giving you praise and honour, for we know that you are the creator and the sustainer of the earth and the one who provides us with the hope of the future, Father. We thank you, especially for the time we have tonight, to consider your word and the importance of your creation. And we thank you for the safety that we can do it in, for we know that there are many people on this globe, Father, who cannot gather together safely for many, many different reasons, Father. And we pray that your words in the Bible will sink into our hearts and affect us, not just in a shallow way, but in an emotional, full way, Father. We pray that your son will soon come back to this earth, and through him we pray. Amen. As I said, James is going to really focus on Genesis 1, verse 1, and the importance of it. So to open our class tonight, I'm going to ask Luke to come up and read to us Genesis 1, verse 1. Afterwards, I'll invite James to come up and present to us tonight. Thank you. Reading with you all, Genesis 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Thanks for that, Luke. Now, I, I uh, chose that reading for two reasons. One was that's what I'm planning on talking about tonight. But also that for those of us who are familiar with the Bible, mask off. Oh. <sighs> much better, much better. All right, start again. So for those of us who are familiar with the Bible, we take a verse like Genesis 1 verse 1 and we just go, oh yeah, yeah, God created everything, that's fine. But for the world around us, by and large, that claim, as we open the Bible, we can you know, open it up and go, in the beginning, well, okay, fair enough. God, not so sure about that, created, definitely not, the heavens and the earth You've gone too far. And so they say, well, we have to come up with a different answer, a different way of asking the basic questions of existence. And that's what we want to cover tonight, is why does anything exist? Why do we exist? Why are we here? Why is the universe here? Why is the world here? And we want to see what ways we have of answering that question. We're going to compare two books. One is the Bible and the other one that I've chosen is the book by the well-renowned uh, physicist Stephen Hawking and uh, his co-author Leonard Mlodinov, but no one talks about him. So the main, well, you, can, you can see it on the title of the book, it's Stephen Hawking with Leonard Mlodinov in very small writing, but I'm going to say, refer to the book as the one by Hawking for two reasons, it's easy to remember and say, and he's the one who's famous for writing it. So the, there's two approaches to this. Are we going to take what the Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth? Or are we going to say, no, 
everything exists only because of natural forces and there is nothing else to it. It's just the laws of nature working together to create existence. So why does anything exist? And, and specifically, if things do exist, why do they exist in the way that they do? And the Bible's answer, and we're going to say this time and time again, is that because God made it that way. Things exist because God made them, and God made them to be that way. And in his book, Hawking puts these questions to us, or to, to the reader, and he says, well, there's three, first of all, three fundamental questions we want to answer. Why is there something rather than nothing? And if you spend time thinking about that, if God doesn't exist, that is a real question to ask. Why is anything? If, if, if there's no primary cause behind it, there's no, nothing that says no decision, no decision has been made to have existence, why is there ground for me to stand on? Why do we exist? What, what purpose do we exist for? And that there are a particular set of laws that govern the universe to a certain extent, or that do govern the universe, and why do we have these laws and not a different set of laws? Why isn't gravity twice as strong or the speed of light twice as slow? Why are all these things in place? And so he says, this is his methodology that he's going to use to try and come up with an answer of why things exist. His answer is that given the state of the universe at one time, a complete set of laws fully determines both the future and the past. This would exclude the possibility of miracles or an active role for God. Now, I read this book in reasonable detail and it's in this paragraph here that he rules out the possibility of miracles. Laws govern the universe, therefore miracles can't happen, therefore God doesn't exist. Okay, let's try and find a different answer. He, he is that quick to just go, let's write this off as a possibility. Let's, let's put this out the way. And he says, this is in fact the basis of all modern science and a principle that is important throughout this book. A scientific law is not a scientific law if it holds only when some supernatural being decides not to intervene. So that's his, in a sense, first, the first principle of Stephen Hawking. The universe exists and it exists only according to the laws and that's all there is to it. It's just a bunch of maths floating around. Okay, so he puts that in place and he says, well, so there's then, if it's just these laws, we get three further questions that we want to answer or have answered for us. What is the origin of the laws? Are there any exceptions to the laws, i.e. miracles? And is there only one set of possible laws? So is there only one way the universe could exist? And if that's the case, so these are, these are our questions, and he then, then puts forward to us a way in which we would find a good answer. This is what he says would be an acceptable answer to these questions. And the questions are, in a sense, quite reasonable. And as far as finding a good answer for how the universe exists, the answer is also, or, or what the answer should look like, is also reasonable. A, a good model for how the universe could be understood is it's good if the model is elegant, contains few arbitrary or adjustable elements. So you're not just choosing things, you know, because that fits and it'll just work. So you're not, not going by that and you're not just changing things to fit where you want. It agrees with and explains all existing observations. So you look at the world around you and go, yep, that makes sense. I can see how that works. And you can go to the science lab and you can do the same thing. And finally, it will make detailed predictions about future observations that can disprove or falsify the model if they are not borne out. And so if we take Newton's laws of physics and we're playing pool and we go and hit the cue ball, cue ball, that's one, yep, and that goes and bounces off against one of the other balls, that other ball is going to go and bounce and hit the edge and maybe go into one of the pockets. And that's all tested. We can go, if you hit it this way, that is going to be the outcome. And so he says, that's what you want to have in your model. But there's a problem for a physicist or for any of us, 
And that is that our universe and its, law, and its laws appear to have a design that is both tailor-made to support us and if we are to exist, leaves little room for alteration. So the universe we're in is pretty much perfect for us and it works quite well. That is not easily explained and raises the natural questions of why it is that way. And on this we would wholeheartedly agree that our universe does appear to have a bit of design to it. But that becomes a problem for someone who says there is no design. It just is. It just works that way because that's the way it is. And so he builds up his worldview, his way of saying, this is how everything fits together. And it starts with this principle here of scientific determinism. And that's what we've already looked at. Everything is governed by laws. And it's only the laws such as gravity and the speed of light and all those other ones, I'm no physicist, if you remember all, the, all of them, but you've got all these laws that say this is how and why particles and matter interact with each other. We've then got this great idea here called the anthropic principle. Hands up if you've heard of that before. Sam has good, at least one person might get what I'm talking about. From the anthropic principle, he uses, moves on to the multiverse theory and then finally gets on to gravity itself as a creative force. And this is a great condensation of a very dense book. But if we take the, the principles behind all of these four ideas, we can hopefully see both what, he, what the argument is that he's trying to make and where we might say there's some flaws or some ways in which the, the very foundation of his argument doesn't stack up. And I'll put it to you that where that really starts is back in his paragraph detailing scientific determinism. That because of scientific determinism, which is just a way of saying science can give us the answers, he says we have to disregard any chance of there being any supernatural power or any sort of miracle at work within the universe. He just writes that off out of hand. So we see, once again, scientific determinism, there can't be a God, it's only laws. And are, these are important things for us to, to try and get into our heads at, if we try and understand what the argument is that's being made. I know for many of us, we might not have uh, thought through this side of things that often. So scientific determinism says everything just exists the way it is, and the laws are there, but we saw from before that he looks at all these laws and says, well, we've, we've got a real problem because all of these laws work in such perfect harmony to make it possible for us to exist on the earth. Now, we can all agree that it is possible, I hope we can all agree on this, it is possible for us all to exist on the earth as it stands at the moment. All comfortable with that? Okay. But it's very unlikely. Everything needs to be perfectly in place for us to exist in there. We're all happy with that. Okay. So his answer to that is the anthropic principle. And all the anthropic principle is, as he says here, that is the fact of our being, so the fact that we exist here on the earth as we do, restricts the characteristics and the kind of environment in which we find ourselves. That principle is called the weak anthropic principle. So we can only exist on a world on which we can exist. Therefore, we must exist on a world in which we can exist. It's a very circular argument. It's very much sort of saying, we exist, therefore we can exist. But it's allegedly profound and a key platform of the argument. So we can exist on the world, therefore we must exist on a world that allows our existence. Right. But we still have a significant problem. The world that we exist in is supremely unlikely. 
So what are the chances of a world turning up somewhere, not only on which it's possible for life to exist, but on which life has come to exist, and life has grown to an intelligence that it can turn around and try and understand the existence of the universe going in. So this is a monumentally unlikely thing to happen, an incalculably unlikely thing to happen. And so he invents, he's not the only one who's done it, they say, and this is, this is the basis of the argument, is our universe, we exist, and this is going in a sense back to the anthropic principle, is we exist in a universe. It is possible for a universe to exist. Everyone nods, it's possible for a universe to exist. Hopefully, good, a few people nodding their heads, good. Right, so it's possible for a universe to exist and the universe is of a finite size. The universe, as scientists understand it, isn't any bigger than it is. It, it, it contains a certain amount of matter and that is the size of the universe. If that's the case, beyond the universe, you have got infinite space. Now, if you can understand that in infinite space, it's possible, I mean, it has to be possible, for a universe to exist, and you've got infinite chances out there for another universe to exist, well, then maybe two universes exist. So now we've got two universes that might exist. But outside of those, you've, you've still got infinite time, infinite space, infinite opportunities for another universe to come to existence. And you can keep pressing copy-paste as many times as you want until you end up with enough universes that exist for our universe to exist and for us to come into existence. And he takes it a whole lot further than that. So he says there, in this view, the universe appeared spontaneously starting off in every possible way. So every possible universe that could exist must have existed and must still exist at all times because you've got infinite chances, infinite possibilities for an infinite number of worlds to exist. So every possible world must exist and we happen to be on one of them. Most of these correspond to other universes. So we've got our universe and there must be a large number of other universes that are fundamentally the same. They correspond to us. It's just the same bunch of physics and chemistry happening again somewhere else. While some of these universes are similar to ours, most are very different. So you know, that sort of makes sense within the theory. Uh, they aren't just different in details, such as whether Elvis really did die young or whether turnips are a dessert food, but rather they differ even in their apparent laws of nature. So not only does all history, and as they understand this is from you know, early evolution the whole way through, every possible outcome exists, we get down to things where you know, turnips are a great dessert food. Now, they're not, but maybe you know, even that universe exists where people go, had our roast chicken for dinner, rightio, onto some turnip, turnips and custard. That sounds delicious. That universe exists. And there's a universe where Elvis really did die young or didn't die young or whatever. That all these possible universes exist. And beyond that, they differ even in their apparent laws of nature. So there's another, another universe where gravity is twice as strong and the speed of light is twice as slow. And What's some other laws of physics? There's two that keep come, popping into my head. So that'll, that'll be the ones that I keep using. That, that every possible universe exists. Therefore, it is in his understanding, the fact that we exist on one is of no real surprise, no real significance. The approach to quantum theory called alternative histories in that view, the universe does not just have a single existence or history, but rather every possible version 
of the universe exists simultaneously. So everything that could possibly ever happen, ever, exists across the multiverse at all times. That's quite a big claim. Like, Genesis 1, but like, there's all these people going, oh, you know, if you, if you take the Genesis 1 record by itself, or the biblical record by itself, you're saying a very big thing about God, and we can't see God. And where did God come from? In a few short chapters, Stephen Hawking and his like have managed to come up with an infinite number of everything that we see around us and every other possible thing, and that's just done with a quick, oh, you know, it's just maths, it's just infinity, and it's fine. To me, it's starting to push the bounds of what is possible. And so this is essentially his view of the universe, that we are in a, in a sea of universes and where our universe is just one of these bubbles. And it just bubbles, sort of the waves are crashing through his cosmic sea. It's beyond cosmic, we don't have the words for it. It's multi-universal cosmic ocean. Waves are crashing, they create bubbles, those bubbles of matter and laws and ten-dimensional space come into existence and therefore another universe pops into existence and this is all not particularly unlikely. He then goes on to say, so everything exists, and he's like, but you, you've still got, okay, take his observations as, as you may, you still haven't done anything to answer the question of, of why is there not just a world, a, a universe, but an infinite number of them. Why is there anything to start with? Why is there anything for anything to work on? And his great statement on, on this is because there is a law like gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. Which, I mean, it, it's a great line, but there's a real problem with it. I think I've got a pen here. So we understand that if I hold the pen up and let the pen go, gravity comes into effect. But gravity and the law of gravity is a way of explaining the relationship between objects with mass. If you don't have an object with mass, there is nothing for that object, to, for that law to operate on. You need mass for gravity to be a thing. I can understand as much as I want that 10 plus 10 equals 20, but understanding that law of maths isn't going to put more money in my bank account. I can, it, it, it's true, we can prove it, we can look at all the numbers, and go, yes, 10 plus 10 equals 20. Where's my money? The law doesn't create substance. But according to Hawking, he goes, well, there's, there's things like the law of gravity, and that will create substance out of nothing. But there's another thing that is presupposing there, and that is that a law exists. A law exists that will control matter should it come into existence. Why should there be a law like that? Why should there be anything that says anything about matter if there is nothing causing any of it. We might think about it like a chocolate cake, because I like thinking about chocolate cakes. Chocolate cakes are nice. We have an example chocolate cake here. Unfortunately, due to COVID restrictions, I can't bring a chocolate cake in and share it around, which was my original idea. I thought this would be good. This would get people's attention because they can eat cake. Some people like cake, and then they might like me. Everything can come into plan. Anyway, we can look at this cake and go, okay, it's dark brown, it's probably chocolate. We could take it into a lab and do some experiments on it and go, ooh, this cake's got approximately 150 grams of sugar and 200 grams of butter. And it appears to have at least some milk. And on the very surface of it, it's got cocoa powder dusted on. And we can find out all these wonderful things about the facts of the cake. But that does nothing at all to answer why was the cake made? Who is the cake for? 
who's going to eat the cake? We're, a- we're answering none of the why questions. All we're doing is observing this is what the universe looks like and trying to make some assumptions as to what it is. And that's what he's doing here. Is he's, he's taken a law like gravity and said, well, that will make, the, you know, we, can, we can observe because of gravity, this lump of matter and that lump of matter will bunch together and create a slightly different sort of matter. And then a bit more matter will come in and it will create a slightly different sort of matter. But it's done nothing to answer the fundamental question. And he actually says this, and this is in chapter 8, right? <laughs> it's about three pages from the end of the book. When he's opened the book saying, we want to answer the why questions, he gets right to the end and says, the laws of nature tell us how the universe behaves. Yep, I can pick up my pen. And gravity still works. So, yep, it tells us how it behaves, but they don't answer the why questions we posed at the start of the book. Well, okay. 200 pages into this, and there's a lot of very complicated physics in it that I didn't really understand. But that's a real problem. You said we want to uh, we want to answer the why questions. Why do we exist? Why is there something rather than nothing? And he says, well, the laws of nature as we observe them don't give us the answers to it. We just have to accept that we do exist and that you know the laws of nature that we haven't come to understand yet will one day tell us the how and possibly the why. And so we go back and we take a look and say, well, we've been told that a good answer to the questions that were posed at the start of the book would be a model that is elegant, contains few arbitrary or adjustable elements, agrees with and explains all existing observations and makes detailed predictions about future observations that can disprove or falsify the models they're not borne out. So that's what he says should be a good answer. Now I'll put it to you that having you know, every possible universe existing in every possible way at all times as a way of explaining our one allegedly insignificant universe isn't a particularly elegant answer. You haven't really explained what's going on here by going, uh, we don't really understand this, therefore everything must always exist everywhere outside of this, otherwise it doesn't make sense. Contains few arbitrary or adjustable elements. His explanation has made the entire observable universe a completely meaningless dot in the expanse of the multiverse. He's made the entire universe arbitrary, essentially meaningless. And in a lovely adjustable way, he said, all other possible universes exist with all possible laws of nature. That seems like a lot of adjustable elements to have in your model. It agrees with and explains all existing observations. We can't observe anything beyond our universe. And we can't even do most of that particularly well. So there is no observation of any part of his model apart from the fact that we exist. And that's what he's basing the whole argument on. And it makes detailed predictions about future observations that can disprove or falsify the model if they're not borne out. If you go into quantum theory, it says there's no such thing as the past and the future, and that if you observe the present, the past will change. Which is, I mean, I don't know. Apparently it makes sense. Anyway, that is essentially the argument that is put forward in the grand design. Now we turn back to the biblical model. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This is a model of beautiful elegant simplicity. We have God, God uncreated, existing for all time, creating the universe, the heavens and the earth as we observe them. A nice, simple answer to the question. But we come back to 
the same set, the same sort of questions. Well, if the universe is just created by a God, why, why are the laws so stable? Why, why is there a law of gravity? Why is there a limit to the speed of light? Well, he puts forward earlier on in the book, in chapter 3, puts forward a hypothetical universe that might exist. And he says there, so he creates this, uh, this hypothetical universe, he says, look, Im imagine there are aliens, because you, you can't have a God creating universe, but ma imagine aliens created a universe. And you live in this universe, what would it be like? And he says, well, the real problem with this, if you've got a creator, they're likely to want to sort of poke and prod and tinker and, you know, adjust bits and pieces just for their own entertainment and to see what would happen. And really, he's <laughs> completely misunderstanding the character of God. But he says there, but if the aliens did enforce consistent laws, there is no way that we could tell there was another reality beyond the, simu the simulated one. It would be easy to call the world the aliens live in the real world and the synthetic one a false one, but if, like us, the beings in the simulated world could not gaze into their universe from the outside, there would be no reason for them to doubt their own picture of reality. Now, that's a somewhat complicated way of saying, if you're in a created world in which the creative beings that are outside it don't tinker with what's inside it, you're going to have difficulty observing them because you can't see them. Now, that seems an awful lot like me, to me, like this model we've got here. We've got a universe and a creative God outside of it that doesn't tinker with how the universe operates. And he says, this would be a perfectly feasible Earth or, or universe, world for people to live in. But, you know, that's only with imaginary aliens, not with a creative God. And so, why are the laws consistent? And we see throughout the scripture that God is a strict law keeper. He's not only a law giver, but he is a law keeper. And we have a law given to us, a, a law of nature, and it's one that we can quite read, readily observe, is that, behold, all souls are mine, the soul of the Father, uh, as well as the soul of the Son is mine. The soul who sins shall die. If you sin, you will die. And we can look at everyone in all of history and everyone who's ever lived has sinned. Romans 5 verse 12 tells us that. Therefore, everyone has died. But there's an exception to the who sins. And what does God say when there's an exception to the sin? Acts 2 verse 24. But God raised him up, speaking of Jesus, unsurprisingly, God raised him up, loosing the pains of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. And so God is a strict keeper of, the, of his own laws that he puts in place. He put a law in place that said, the soul who sins shall die. Jesus didn't sin, therefore it wasn't possible for him to be held by the law of sin and death. God couldn't interact with that. God couldn't stop that from occurring. It's not possible for Jesus to be held in the grave. If we come to Jeremiah, he actually speaks directly to the laws of nature on the planetary level. Thus saith the Lord, who gives the sun for light by day and the fixed order of the moon and the stars for light by night. And we note that those words there, fixed order. That these things, the heavenly bodies, work by fixed order. They're not just there by whim that, you know, God just says, oh, yep, sun, you know, earth, keep going around the sun and yeah, spin at whatever rate you feel like. No, everything that's occurring out there in space is by a fixed order. It's going to stick to these laws. The fixed order of the moon and the stars for light by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If this fixed order departs from before me, declares the Lord, then shall the offspring of Israel cease from being a nation forever before me. So he says, this universe exists by fixed law. This is the way it's going to operate and that's how it's going to be. And over in chapter 33 of Jeremiah, he goes in a sense one step further than that. He says, thus saith the Lord, if I have not established my covenant 
with the day and the night and the fixed order of heaven and earth, then I'll reject the offspring of Jacob. So by the same way that God says he's going to deal with us, he has an established covenant with the day and the night and the fixed order of the heavens. Is the creative God of this world, as, as is revealed to us in the Bible, is he one that's going to tinker and just pull the strings? No. He says it's by fixed order and by a covenant that he's made. And so we're not going to see the universe behaving randomly as, as, as Stephen Hawking would like. If, in his view, if there's a God, weird things would be happening all the time with no explanation. But God says, no, 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 I'm not a God like that. I'm a God who says, this is how the laws of nature are going to work and he makes sure they keep working like that. And so why, is, why do all of the laws exist? Because of the nature and character of the Creator. Next, and perhaps most significantly, are miracles possible? Is there any evidence, is there any glimpse of the supernatural forces? Because In that section we looked at just before, we see there that he wrote, but if, like us, the beings in the simulated world could not gaze into their universe from the outside, there will be no reason for them to doubt their own picture of reality. Because if you could only look at this world, you would have no way of glimpsing the supernatural power outside of it that created it. But do we, is that actually true of the God of the Bible? Or has he said, I'm going to give you a way of glimpsing my supernatural power, a power that is beyond what man can control? Now, we're going to go into some of my favourite passages here and I can shoehorn them in, so I will. Isaiah 46, this is God's great declaration of his existence and of the evidence for his existence. Isaiah 46, verse 9 and 10, For I am God and there is no other, I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose. So God's saying, I'm going to tell you at the start what's going to happen at the end and by that, you're going to know that I'm God. Now, we all know that we can't tell anyone what's going to happen in the future. We don't know what's going to happen. And we have the example that we like to drag out on all of these occasions and we do it for a very good reason. So we have there, and this is the Olivet Prophecy spoken by Christ in Luke 21, They'll fall by the edge of the sword, that's the Jewish people, and be led captive among all nations, and Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Now, when were the times of the Gentiles fulfilled? Let's see if anyone's awake. 1967. Perfect. So 1948, Israel became a nation again. 1967, they retook Jerusalem. Now, we repeat this so often in our lectures that look at this, Israel's back in the land. Isn't this prediction so amazing? Now, I want to take another quote from Stephen Hawking. And here he is talking about free will. And he says, because by his understanding of the universe, all we are is a very fancy experiment of chemistry and physics. That's all we are. We don't control any of this. We're just chemicals and atoms fizzing and bubbling around really fancy. I mean, other people are fancier than me, but, you know, in, in, this, in the scheme of things, quite a fancy random chemistry experiment. But he says there, how can one tell if a being has free will? So how, how would you be able to tell that something can actually have agency and choice in the actions that it takes. If one encounters an alien, how can one tell if it is just a robot or it has a mind of its own? The behaviour of a robot will be completely determined, which is, which is, in his view, essentially what we are. We're pre-programmed by the Big Bang and by all the fancy chemistry and physics that's happened since then, and we're just sort of bouncing off of each other and we'll die and 
all the chemistry and physics will keep happening to a future generation. That's all we are. We are pre-programmed. The behaviour of a robot would be completely determined, unlike that of a being with free will. Thus, one could, in principle, detect a robot as a being whose actions can be predicted. So you tell a robot to go and do something, the robot goes and does it. And this would be great if you're trying to do prophecy on a robot. I predict the robot's going to start here and walk over there. Tap, tap, tap away at the computer, press start, right, computer, the robot starts here, walks over there. Really, really easy prediction to make. As we said in chapter two, this may be impossibly difficult if the being is large and complex. So that becomes remarkably difficult if we're big. He goes on to say, we cannot even solve exactly the equations for three or more particles interacting with each other. So we can't, if you get more than two, it gets really hard to work out. And you know, if you think about it as a pool table, it's nice if you've got you know, the cue ball and another ball and you, you can sort of work out what's going to happen. If there's other balls that are in the way, just sort of a bit of gusto and hope for the best. It's hard to work out what's going to happen. Since an alien the size of a human would contain about a thousand trillion trillion particles, even if the alien were a robot, it would be impossible to solve the equations and predict what it would do. So it says us as a, you know, roughly human-sized person, just by trying to work out the, what we're going to do based on physics and chemistry, it's going to be impossible for us to predict that. So we assume we have free will and assume we have choice. We would therefore have to say that any complex being has free will, not as a fundamental feature, but as an effective theory, an admission of our inability to do the calculations that would enable us to predict its actions. So what's he saying there? To try and work out what an individual is going to do at any time, just by doing the maths on it, is impossibly difficult to calculate. So we just have to pretend people have free will, even though according to him, we don't. It's impossibly difficult to calculate. So what does God do, and what does Christ do, in their statement about the history of Israel? They predicted, or Christ predicted, by the power of God, back in, you know, 30 odd, AD, that Israel is going to go into captivity, 70, AD 70, and come back into their land a vast amount of time later. And during that time, we have got countless billions of people interacting. How on earth can the calculation be made back there, even with an infinite amount of knowledge about what's going on in every single person in the universe throughout all that time, what they're going to be doing, how do you make the calculation that says this is going to happen here and this is going to happen nearly 2,000 years later? This is an impossible prediction to make. And it's not just one prediction. This is the scattering and regathering of Israel is a consistent and constant statement in the Bible that this is the basis of all Bible prophecy. Deuteronomy 30 verse 3 then Yahweh your God will restore your fortunes and have mercy on you and he will gather you again from all the people where Yahweh your God has scattered you. Isaiah 11 verse 12, he'll raise a signal for the nations and will assembly, assemble the banished of Israel and gather the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Jeremiah 30 verse 3, for behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I'll restore the fortunes of my people, Israel and Judah. And that says the Lord, and I'll bring them back to the land that I gave to their fathers, and they shall take possession of it. Ezekiel 37, verse 21. Then say to them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I'll take the people of Israel from the nations among which they have gone, and will gather them from all around, all around and bring them to their own land. Amos 9, verse 14. I'll restore the fortunes of my people Israel, and they shall rebuild the ruined cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink their wine. They shall make their, make their gardens and eat their fruit. This is a consistent and constant message of the Bible. 
Now, unlike the multiverse theory, we've only got one of these Bibles to choose from. There is only one Bible. There is only one book in which God has chosen to reveal himself. And he puts these predictions, these statements of what history is going to be into it well in advance in a way that is impossible to calculate and says, I'm going to tell you what the end result is going to be. And so I ask you, is it possible, just possible, that there are supernatural forces that are in existence within the universe and that just possibly might have created it? And so we take another look at our model. What is going to be a good answer to the existence of the universe? It's elegant. We have one universe and one God who has created it based on fixed laws that he has decided. It contains few arbitrary or adjustable elements. The God who created it abides by the laws he created it with and he keeps his covenant with that. It agrees with and explains all existing observations. We can look at the world around us and marvel at the creative force that's in it. And it makes detailed predictions about future observations that can disprove or falsify the model if they are not borne out. Throughout the Old and New Testament, God time and time again said, I am going to scatter and I am going to regather Israel back to their own land, back to Jerusalem. Time and time again. That is a solid detailed prediction that if it doesn't happen, then God doesn't exist and God's power is not behind it. But it did happen. So we can be confident that God exists. And unlike the view of Hawking that there's no real answer as to why anything's here, why is physics the way it is, when we turn to God, we have a deeper question. Why has God put us here on this earth? For thus saith the Lord who created the heavens, he is God, who formed the earth and made it. He established it. He did not create it empty. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is no other. He created this world for us to live in. And beyond that, he created it for us to have a relationship with him. Turn to me, and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. All these questions that we put up at the start of the night, as hard as he tried, Hawking in his book was unable to come up with a compelling answer to any of them. But if we turn to the Bible and give the Bible a chance for us to just take a look at it. We have compelling answers to all of these questions and they give us a hope of life to come. Thanks. James, thank James for his words tonight. Um, for me, it's really showing two things. One, the power of God, and just as greatly, the extent to which man will go to ignore and replace God, like creating thousands or an infinite number of universes so that your maths works out seems a bit out there to me. Um, next week, we're going to simply have a look at some of nature's wonders that show that there is indeed design on our earth. So please, I invite you all to come again next week um, to have a look at that together and also to stay for supper and to ask James lots of physics questions because I'm sure he can answer those for you. Um, to finish tonight, just as like we started, we will close in prayer. So if you all just rise, we'll close in prayer. Thank you. Father above, sustainer, creator of all things. We bow before you now, Father, thanking you and giving you praise and honour for creating this earth and all its beauty. 
And we also thank you, Father, and give you praise and honour for providing us with a hope that saves us from the sin and the horror of this globe, Father. We continually pray that we will appreciate the fact that you did create this earth and that you did create it to be filled with your glory. And most importantly, we pray, Father, that we will act on this knowledge. We also thank you, Father, for the rain that we've had today, for we know that it is needed so that life grows. And we also thank you for the supper that we have, and we pray for a safe ride home this evening, Father. We leave this evening in your care and pray that your son will soon come back to this earth. And through him we pray. Amen.